My name is Julia Grimes. I'm the Deputy Director of the Dunhuang Foundation, and it is my extraordinary pleasure tonight to welcome you to our final webinar, but not our final event of the year. I will speak a little further on that later. Um, this will be a presentation by Carl Debresny of the Rubin Museum in New York. Uh, this year, as everyone knows, has not been a very easy one. And we wanted at the foundation to take a moment to express our thanks to each and every one of you for joining us tonight, and especially for all of your continued support. It means so much to us, especially in these challenging times. So from all of us at the foundation, thank you. Before beginning tonight's lecture, I wanted to mention we'll be hosting a virtual holiday concert featuring the music of the Silk Roads performed by the chamber group Eurasia Consort. This concert will be live on our webpage, which is dunhuangfoundation.us under the news section uh, next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I will follow up with further details after tonight's presentation. Now, I'd like to take a moment and introduce our speaker this evening. Carl de Bresny is Senior Curator, Collections and Research at the Rubin Museum of Art, New York, where he's worked since 2006. He completed a double master's in art history and Tibetan studies at Indiana University, his PhD in art history at the University of Chicago, and he was a Fulbright Hayes Fellow to China and a National Gallery of Art Caspa Idelson Fellow. He's conducted field research in various locations along the Sino-Tibetan border. Uh, Carl has an article in the current edition of Arts of Asia, which is titled Recrafting Remote Antiquity, Art of the Tenth Karmapa. And he'll be discussing that a little bit later in this evening's presentation. In 2019, Carl curated the exhibition Faith and Empire Art and Politics in Tibetan Buddhism at the Rubin Museum. The suggested reading for tonight's lecture was taken from the accompanying catalog. Now, without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Carl, who will be speaking on Icons in Silk, Images of Power, Art, Politics, and Tibetan Buddhism on the Silk Road and beyond. Thank you. So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you, Julia, for that kind introduction and for inviting uh, the invitation to speak. Thank you for the uh, invitation to speak to the Dunhuang Foundation Lecture Series today. I'm uh, still a little giddy from Ping's presentation on her remarkable provenance research, and I feel honored to be included among such scholars. Today, I will be focusing on the intersection of politics, religion, and art in Tibetan Buddhism highlighting the central role that the Silk Road played in the development and spread of this religio-political system across the empires of North Asia. First, I must preface that I am not a Silk Road scholar, although today I play one on TV. And my own area of research focuses more on 15th to 18th century artistic exchange between the Tibetan and Chinese traditions, right, after Dunhuang ceases as an active site. So even though my own area of specialization is a bit later, as this is the Dunhuang Foundation today, I will endeavor to linger more on earlier material and the Silk Road and explore how religious, political, and artistic patterns established there had far-reaching effects across Inner Asia up to the 20th century. I did have the great fortune to spend a month at Dunhuang in 1998 as part of the Dunhuang Summer Seminar, a joint research project with the Dunhuang Research Academy and Chinese, American, and European professors and graduate students focusing on the artistic programs of Buddhist caves at Mogao and Yulin. And thanks to Sonia Lee, Kate Lingley, and Anne Fung for helping me pull together a few readings on Dunhuang to help catch up at least a little on the last 20 years of research. So I look forward to your feedback, admonitions, and suggestions, especially from any specialists in this area on whose territory I poach today. And if you don't want to embarrass me in front of everyone publicly, you can always email me afterwards. So how do political leaders rise to power? What give them the right to rule? A question on many people's minds these days. Religious claims to political power are a global phenomenon and Tibetan Buddhism once offered a divine means to power and legitimacy to rule. 
Today, we will explore the intersection of politics, religion, art, and Tibetan Buddhism on the Silk Road and beyond. At the heart of this dynamic is the force of religion to claim political power. Tibetan Buddhism was especially attractive to conquest dynasties as it offered both a legitimizing model of universal sacral kingship, right, that is a religious mandate to rule that transcended ethnic and clan divisions to unite disparate people. It also promised esoteric means to physical power, that is ritual magic, which could be harnessed to expand empires. Tibetan Buddhism's dynamic political role was a major catalyst in moving it beyond Tibet's borders, east to its neighbors, the Tanguts, the Mongols, the Chinese, and the Manchus. By the 12th century, Tibetan masters became renowned across Inner Asia as bestowers of this anointed rule and occult power. The use of reincarnation in particular as a means of succession was a unique Tibetan form of political legitimacy, employed first by courts in Tibet and brought to empires to the East. Images were one of the primary means of political propagation, integral to magical tantric rites and embodiments of its power. And it was on this, in these Silk Road kingdoms that these Tibetan tantric traditions were politically integrated with the imperial system on a Chinese model. Yet Buddhism's involvement in politics is largely invisible in the popular view of the Dharma. This gap stems from Western perceptions of the tradition, which are largely romanticized projections born from its colonial encounters. The notion that this is a faith of, of nonviolence is a popular misconception resulting from a separation from this history. In other words, historically, this was not the emphasis. To project this back into the past is both ahistorical and misleading, though projecting the present interests back into the past is as old as history itself. In politics, this was a, <clears throat> a path to legitimation and a means to power, its ritual a potential weapon of war and art its conduit. Indeed, Buddhism has been engaged as a political force beginning in India, as discussed by Ron Davidson, there was an early emphasis in Buddhism on nonviolence and a wary stance towards political power. However, with the fragmentation of classical India in sixth century, India broke up into many small regional kingdoms, all vying for power. A series of invasions threatened Buddhism, putting the very survival of entire Buddhist communities into question. So the rise of Vajrayana corresponds with a period of warfare and political instability in India. In this political context, one sees a shift, an adjustment in Tantric Buddhism's political and military engagement. Tibetans embraced these Tantric developments of Buddhism in India, such as the recasting of the Buddha as a nexus of religious and political authority, blurring the distinction between secular and sacred power. Foremost among the Indian Buddhist models of kingship was the image of the universal ruler. The Chakravartin, or wheel-turning king, represented a concept of sacral rule whereby a devout king spread Buddhism, thus giving the ruler sanction to expand his empire. Such political imagery was embedded in the very language of Tantric Buddhism. Such imagery included the coronation of the initiate and the kingdom as mandala. Themes of royal dominion are specifically applied to the mandala, which is an idealization and sanctification of the architecture of royal authority. In the center, in his palace, the Buddha is the ruler of the mandala. Imperial interest in aspects of political power promised by Buddhism was very much going on in other empires at this time, involving a similar language of control and coercion. In a word, power. And uh, here we have a depiction of the guardian king Vaishravana at Yulin, who was very popular in the Tang for his military prowess. For instance, the wrathful deity Achala was important to Amogavajra, a politically active monk from Samarkand of Sogdian descent at the, Tang at the Tang court, who translated at least six texts dedicated to this deity and likely employed related ritual texts, uh, related rituals against the Tibetan military as they closed in on the Tang Chinese capital of Chang'an in 765. Military application of Achala's ritual during the Tang included immobilizing enemy armies. Banners of Achala's image or his mantra were placed on the front ranks of battle. Court patronage played a central role in the support and spread of Buddhism throughout Asia. This was largely a top-down process of conversion where a ruler would be converted and then spread through court patronage or even edict, not so much a grassroots movement. 
With the spread of Buddhism came the transmission of a complex visual culture that continued to develop as it adjusted to each cultural context. A sustained meeting and coexistence of different traditions often occurred when one group ruled over another, but patronized several Buddhist traditions simultaneously, such as the Mongol and Manchu empires rule of China. This provided fertile territory for the emergence of hybrid traditions as the visual language was shaped by patrons needs and the combination of imported models and local artists commissioned to make these works, which in turn took on its own political significance. All right, now I am not a wizard at technology, but let me see if this works. All right. Yes. This tradition functioned politically in a range of empires over 1,200 years from the eighth to the early 20th century. The Tibetan empire, the Tonggut Shisha kingdom, the Mongol empire, the Chinese Ming dynasty, and the Manchu Qing dynasties all embraced this path. This digital map developed for the Faith and Empire exhibition last year shows each empire at the height of its territorial reach along with the timeline, illustrating the transmission of this tradition, not only through time, but also across overlapping territories. So here it is really the overlapping territories that I wanna emphasize with this little animation. Now covering 1,200 years, five different regimes and cultures in about an hour is a bit overly ambitious. So here I am only skimming the surface. The idea is to provide the overarching religio-political patterns that link these empires throughout the course of history. As you look at each regime, how this political role develops, refines, but also where it diverges. So it is in the seventh to ninth century that Tibetans first dramatically step onto the world stage in the form of the Tibetan empire, which became one of the great military powers of Asia and Tang dynasty China's greatest military rival. The Tibetans themselves did not appear as an identifiable people until this period from the seventh to ninth century with the rise of the Tibetan empire, which disparate people, <clears throat> when disparate people were united a written language established and a perception of kingship formed that was not there before. In 676, the Tibetans made their first foray into China proper in Gansu, threatening Tang, wealth and world position. At the apex of Tibetan power, when Tibet invaded deep into China proper, climaxing with the Tibetans marching into the Tang capital of Chang'an itself in 763, even going so far as to place their own puppet emperor on the Tang throne. The earliest surviving Sino-Tibetan artistic exchange also dates to the eighth and ninth centuries when the Tibetan empire ruled over large Chinese subject, subject populations in the Hushi area of Gansu, including Dunhuang, marked here by a red diamond. An important center of Buddhist activity in the Gobi Desert at the Eastern end of the Silk Road with a long tradition of cave temples stretching back to the fourth century with 492 caves containing some 45,000 square meters of wall paintings. And this, the Tang period, what's considered its artistic golden age. The Tibetans participated in the patronage of local workshops, as well as introducing and incorporating new visual forms into the locally established traditions, resulting in beautiful hybrids of Indic model and Chinese brush, as you see here. At the beginning of Tibetan rule at Dunhuang in 781, Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan art were still early in their formative stages, as the first Tibetan monastery, Samye, was founded only two years before in 779, coinciding with the adoption of Buddhism as the Tibetan state religion. Thus, the translation and artistic activity at Dunhuang itself also had an impact on what was to become known as Tibetan Buddhism. There are also inscribed examples of paintings at Dunhuang done in a mixture of styles, such as the scroll painting dated by Tibetan and Chinese inscription to 836, which states that it was painted by a monk with the Tibetan name Pelyang. Notice I did not say a Tibetan painter, as we know different ethnicities, including ethnic Chinese and others, used Tibetan language and even took Tibetan initiation names during this period. 
During this period, one sees the appearance of Tibetan figures alongside Chinese in paintings found at Dunhuang, such as this illustration from the death of the Buddha in cave 158, where the Tibetan emperor leads the rulers of the Buddhist world in grieving for the passing of the Buddha. So you see him here, and this is originally this part, which is now lost. The figure was labeled Tsempo, the Tibetan imperial dynastic title reserved for the emperor here in this horizontal cartouche. Note too that the Tibetan emperor is larger and only he is given a canopy over his head up here, marking his special status. And Sha Wu Tian suggests Sogdian patronage of cave in cave 158 and a dating of about 839. And as we learned at Indiana University, the Sogdians are everywhere. In an illustration from a local Chinese family cave, the Yin family dated 839, the political relationship between China and Tibet is laid bare. So here's a detail. The Chinese emperor on the left has lost his sword and is down to three tassels of rank on his cap. Actually, it looks like one. Uh, while the Tibetan emperor on the right is larger, is raised on a dais, and his camp is armed to the teeth. So I don't know if you can see these uh, heavy broadswords hanging from their belts, whereas the Chinese camp is totally denuded of weapons. This painting dates to shortly after this region, the Hushi Corridor was ceded by the Tang to the Tibetan Empire in 822. Thus, this religious painting, commissioned by one of the local leading Chinese families at Dunhuang, makes a clear and dramatic statement about the local political rat reality on the ground. To my knowledge, this is the earliest datable expression of Tibetan political power in a religious painting. Tibetan state patronage at Dunhuang has been suggested by Matthew Capstein in Yulin Cave 25, which appears to be closely related to the Treaty Edict Temple described in ninth century Tibetan documents found at Dunhuang, dedicated by the local Tibetan military government on the occasion of the signing of the Sino-Tibetan Treaty of 822. While the style of the paintings are a combination of Chinese and a new aesthetic introduced under Tibetan rule, there is a clear unifying theme, that of the universal Chakravartin ruler. This theme of sacrosanct rulership is actually stated in the Treaty Temple's dedication, which is equated with the building of a divine palace, a mandala, where the merit generated is dedicated to the Tibetan emperor, and I quote, so that he can become a Chakravartin ruler, exercising authority over the four continents and other kingdoms as well. Vairochana and the eight great bodhisattvas painted on the Western wall of Yulin Cave 25, which you see here, is based on distinctive iconic iconic models which began to appear during Tibetan rule. Vairochana, <clears throat> excuse me, Vairochana became the center of a new Tibetan state cult where the emperor was equated with Vairochana, the cosmic ruler. Within Buddhist cosmology, Vairochana was viewed as the cosmic ruler of the universe and was often adopted in Buddhist cultures across Asia by royal courts and used as a symbol of their imperial rule, a kind of ritual mastery of the universe. As explained by Brandon Dotson, this practice was particularly prominent in the eighth to 10th century when monarchs traded on the imagery of the Buddha Vairochana to underpin their claims as universal Buddhist sovereigns. Here, the Buddha Vairochana and the ruler merged in an analogy of all pervading presence and dominion. Cassian suggests that through this adoption of Vairochana imagery in Tibet, the entire empire was viewed as an extended Vairochana mandala, and that sites such as Yulin Cave 25 were intended to ritually mark the inclusion of a Hoshi area into the mandala of the Tibetan Empire. And this form of Vairoch <clears throat> Vairochana in particular was intended to represent the presence of the Tibetan emperor. Now, there was some pushback to Capstein's initial identification of Yulin Cave 25 as the, excuse me, as the treaty, treaty edict temple. And he has since reconsidered his identification more recently, nevertheless maintaining that they must be closely re related with Yulin Cave 25 being either a prototype or a copy of the temple described in the treaty, treaty edict temple's document. I would suggest that both might relate to a series of such temples that ritually marked the inclusion of the territory into the Tibetan empire. Part of this larger pattern can be seen in several surviving rock carvings in the Northern Sino-Tibetan borderland, today's Qinghai and Gansu area, studied by Amy Heller. 
dated to the early ninth century. And here you see two examples dated 806 and 816, which depict Virochana and the eight great bodhisattvas and draw on the same visual models found in Yulin Cave 25. One such carving was even associated with the same peace treaty negotiations of 822 and lists the names of both Tibetan and Chinese artists. Some of these carvings include visual expressions of this conflation of deity and ruler with Virochana depicted in the royal uh, boots and robes of the Tibetan emperor, which you can see here. Virochana imagery merging with the deity and ruler continued after the collapse of the Tibetan empire into the 11th and 12th centuries. One such example is the sculpture of a prominently crowned deity dressed in boots and royal robes adorned with distinctive Sasanian rondels, which you see here on the right. Here are the rondels, which are associated with Tibetan royal figures. And here, of course, you have the first Tibetan emperor, Tsongtsen Gampo, in this same uh, clothing, conflating the identity of ruler and deity. Later, the Tibetan emperor was considered an emanation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, patron deity of Tibet. This conflated identity soon became an important political symbol, especially with the reunification of Tibet under the Dalai Lamas in the 17th century. Even after the Tibetan emperor Long Dharma's assassination in 842 and the ensuing collapse of the Tibetan empire, Tibetan rule at Dunhuang continued for six more years and Tibetan continued to be used locally as the language of religion, trade, and diplomacy 100 years after the collapse of the empire. As demonstrated by Beckwith and Van Schaik, Tibetan continued to be used as a lingua franca in greater Eastern Central Asia, including the Hoshi area, and in the context of Tantric Buddhism, even between ethnic Chinese. So anyway, here we see Tibetan cartouches and inscription on the back of this uh, 10th century painting. After the collapse of the Tibetan Empire, its former territories to the east of Lake Kokonor, that is the Qinghai Gansu area, were united by the Tibetan Tsongkha Kingdom during a fragmented period of warfare between vying states. The Tsongkha Kingdom is known in Chinese sources as Qingtang, and much of what we know come from such Chinese sources. Positioning themselves as inheritors of the Tibetan Empire's political legacy in the east, the Tsongkha Kingdom was established by a minister monk who brought in an infant prince of the Tibetan imperial family from central Tibet to the area and had him declared emperor in 1008 using the old Tibetan imperial dynastic title, Tsempo. This ruler's name, as it comes down to us in Chinese, Gusulo, probably a transcription of Gelse, meaning son of a king, or can also mean Bodhisattva. The kingdom of Tsongkha served as an important buffer state between the Song dynasty and its rapidly expanding neighbor, the Tangut Emperor, Empire of Shisha to the west. Tibetan Tsongkha was also the Song dynasty's gateway to the west, providing the Chinese with much needed horses, the medieval world's most valuable military asset. Thus, Tsongkha's position on the Silk Road between Song and Xia made it a wealthy kingdom, despite its small size, capable of supporting large-scale monastic projects along the northern Sino-Tibetan border. Great monastic institutions of the Tibetan Empire continued to flourish under Tsongkha. Tibetan monastic institutions like Triga Monastery near Qinghai Lake and Dantik Monastery in Gansu continue to thrive in the area long after the fall of the Tibetan Empire and maintain close ties to Dunhuang. Thus, the impact of Tibetan Buddhist activities continue to be felt at Dunhuang even after the local Chinese regained control. The prominent place that Buddhism held at the Tibetan Tsongkha court is attested to in the eyewitness account of a Song military official's experience in the 1099 campaign against Tsongkha in the Qingtang Lu, or record of Qingtang. It tells of a jewel encrusted gilt bronze statue of the Buddha, dozens of feet tall, which was near the throne room, and of a, a Buddhist temple spanning over a mile with monks residents numbing, numbering over a thousand and a 13 story stupa with a great statue covered in gold. It goes on to say that the Tibetans had a great respect for monks and that in dealing with important affairs, Tibetans were always consult, uh, Tibetans always consulted them. This account suggests that large scale Tibetan institutional that is monastic Buddhism was flourishing and that monks were involved in politics and the state at the highest levels in this small Tibetan Silk Road kingdom even before the Tanguts took power. Positioning themselves as inheritors of the Tibetan Empire's political legacy in the East, 
and using it the imperial sponsorship of Buddhism as a major touchstone of their rhetoric, the Tsongkha kingdom almost certainly perpetuated imperial Tibetan Buddhist visual models, which they had been established in the Hoshi area. The Tsongkha kingdom also played an important role in the transmission of Buddhist activities in the Tibetan cultural world in the post-imperial period. Buddhism is described in this early period as strongest on Tibet's eastern border, and the Amdo area being specifically mentioned in Tibetan sources. Central Tibet, after all, looked to the monasteries in the east for the reestablishment of the Vinaya, or monastic law. Indeed, it was from this region that Tibetan monastics, such as Lachen, who trained a group of monks from central Tibet, such as the famous Lume, that helped reseed Tibetan monasticism, right? That is institutional Buddhism in central Tibet in the late 10th century. Meanwhile, in central Tibet, after the collapse, <clears throat> Tibetan empire collapsed and there was a period of political fragmentation and chaos, often depicted as a kind of a dark ages, the lack of a centralized political or religious authority gave rise to local tantric masters establishing their own authority. As institutional Buddhism began to regain its footing in the 11th to 13th centuries, the image of the Tibetan emperor as a bodhisattva transformed into a potent religio-political symbol. The first to effectively appropriate this symbol of legitimacy by declaring himself a reincarnation of the Tibetan emperor was Lama Shang, who you see here. Directly involving himself in political and military affairs, Lama Shang is himself a fascinating study in the political and martial employment of Vajrayana Buddhism during the late 12th century. Lama Shang ruled territory, enforced secular law, describing his actions as kingly deeds. He even fielded his own students in battle as part of their religious practice. Equipped not only with conventional weapons such as bows and spears, Lama Shang also employed a ritualized warfare of magic spells aided by the summoning of powerful protector deities such as Sri Devi and Mahakala. Interestingly, Lama Shang's own small Kagyu monastic suborder had direct ties to the Tangut court, the next political polity to rise to prominence. For instance, the Tangut imperial preceptor Chishi Repa, while ethnically a Tangut, trained with Lama Shang. It was under Lama Shang's tutelage that the foundations were laid for the future Tangut imperial preceptor's involvement with the cult of the protector deity Mahakala as a means towards worldly empowerment. The Tangut kingdom, known in Chinese as Xixia and in Tibetan Minyak, a small but powerful multi-ethnic kingdom that ruled the eastern end of the Silk Road, inherited aspects of the Tibetan Empire's cultural legacy in the east. And this sense of inheritance is suggested at Dunhuang in the special interest the Tangut seemed to show in the caves from the period of Tibetan rule. The Tonguts first established many of the imperial practices of Tibetan Buddhism and art at court, later emulated by larger regimes, such as the Mongol Empire. Tibetan and Chinese religious and artistic traditions were integrated through Tongut patronage, creating a new visual model of sacral rule. This included both political and artistic forms that later became characteristic of imperial engagement with Tibetan Buddhism up until the early 20th century. The Tongan Empire was an expansionist multi-ethnic state directly in the Silk Route between Tibet and China and included large Tibetan and Chinese subject populations. And here on this map, you can see the Tongats are multiple crossroads, right? You've got the Jurchen Jin uh, on the east, the Mongols to the north, the, uh, the Khitan Liao uh, to the northwest, the Tibetans uh, to the west, uh, and the Chinese to the south. The Tongats grew heavily <clears throat> Sorry, the Tonguts drew heavily on Chinese models in establishing their own imperial culture, including governmental administration and their script. However, with the fall of the Chinese Northern Song in 1127, coupled with the dynamic revival of Buddhist activity in Tibet in the 11th and 12th centuries, the Tongut court turned increasingly to the Tibetan realm for guidance. This included the custom of a Tibetan Buddhist monk serving as imperial preceptor at the Tongut court shortly after Tsongkhas incorporation into Xixia. Indeed, the Tonguts seemed engaged with all of the major religious centers in central Tibet as well, especially those of the Kagyu and Sakya orders. Buddhism served in state and legitimation and engendered lavish imperial patronage, the Tonguts emperors presenting themselves as universal Chakravartin rulers and Bodhisattva kings. Among the Northern nomads, the Tonguts emperors were known as the Buddha Khan. 
The Tongats employed a self-conscious multicultural strategy, editing texts in three languages at once, Tongat, Chinese, and Tibetan. And their art, one also sees a mixing of both the Chinese and Tibetan iconographic as well as stylistic traditions to meet the Tongat patrons' particular needs. This can be seen from objects excavated from Tongat sites, such as Karakoto, uh, which you see here, as well as caves dating to the rule of uh, their rule of Dunhuang, which they absorbed in around 1036. For instance, in one painting excavated at Karakoto, this combination is quite striking. For while the central triad of Amitabha and the two bodhisattvas, as well as the pure land seen below, are drawn from iconographic and stylistic modes of the Chinese Southern Song, the eight medicine Buddhas above to either side here on the left and right are Tibetan depictions clearly mixing Chinese and Tibetan genres. One hallmark of the Tonglet court were lavish silk images, such as silk tapestries or kisa, a complex luxury medium developed in Central Asia, especially by the, the Uyghurs and adopted by the Tonglet court for the making of Tibetan Buddhist icons. And this one you see here is, uh, was excavated at Karakoto. The Tongrits were the source of many such imperial court practices, integrating Tibetan Buddhist imagery with Chinese luxury media that would be emulated for centuries to come. Surviving Chinese seed pearls woven into the textile in the Cleveland Museum gives a sense of the lavishness of these commissions. These are threaded down the warp prior to weaving, not added later. This special feature is shared with other silk tapestries attributed to the Tongut period. According to Russian scholarship, and I do not read Tongut myself, Tongut documents record that their government maintained workshops which specialized in the Kosa technique. Later Tibetan sources likewise record memory of such silk tapestries as characteristic of Tongut gifts to Tibetan hierarchs. For instance, the inscription at the bottom of this silk tapestry of Achala which due to the weaving technique could not be easily added later, reads, to the great master Jetsun Kun Drakpa Gyeltsen, the Kampa student Zhang Tsundu Drak makes this image an offering. According to a colophon of a text by the recipient Drakpa Gyeltsen, which was written at the request of the same donor Tsundu Drak and dated 1210. This date gives a rough time frame for the association of patron and recipient, as well as the commissioning of this image as the language in the Silk's cartouche suggests that Drakpa Gelsen was still alive when it was given, uh, he dies in 1216. And we also learn that the patron of this image was from Tsongka, that small uh, Tibetan Silk Road kingdom absorbed by the Tonguts that we just talked about a moment ago, which was an important source of transmission for both Tibetan traditions on the Silk Road and in central Tibet. The continued debate in distinguishing Tonglet Sisha and Mongol Yuan objects, especially silks, such as this one, speak to the close relationship between the two court traditions and the continuity of this visual production from the 12th into the 13th and 14th centuries. The printed icon of a wrathful deity excavated from the Tonglet site of Karakoto is a clear example of mixing both Chinese and Tibetan traditions. It bears invocations which make its political rule clear. At right, long life to the emperor, and at left, peace to the people, grandeur to the state, conflating religious power and political authority. The wrathful deity, Mahakala in particular, became a special focus of Tonggut imperial Buddhism. Mahakala is a powerful Buddhist protector deity, a manifestation of divine wrath used in removing obstacles and historically considered especially effective in military applications. For instance, one Tibetan Buddhist cleric who is tied to the Tonggu imperial line, Tsami Lotsawa, is linked to at least 16 texts on this wrathful deity Mahakala, including one called The Instructions of Sri Mahakala, The Usurpation of Government, a short how-to work on overthrowing a state and taking power. So as you can see, this is not subtle and we are not just reading between the lines. Indeed, Mongol interest in Tibetan Buddhism can be traced to their potent encounter with this wrathful deity Mahakala through their military campaign against the Tonggut Empire of Xisha in the early 1200s. By the time of the Mongol invasions, Tibetan clerics served as imperial preceptors at the Xisha court, where Mahakala was a focus of Tonggut court Buddhism. For instance, when Chinggis Khan first laid siege to the Tonggut capital in 1210, 
The Tongret's Tibetan Buddhist imperial preceptor, Trishi Repa, right? This is the same student of Lama Shang's previously mentioned, summoned Mahakala to the battlefield. When he tossed the ritual effigy, he had a vision of the deity on the battlefield and the dams the Mongols were using to flood the city burst, drowning Mongol troops and forcing Chinggis to withdraw. This account of their unusual military setback to effective religious ritual no doubt caught Mongol attention. Later, both the Buddhist model of the Chakravartin Sakra rule and the cult of the protector deity Mahakala, both ministered by Tibetan clerics, were adopted by the Mongol state. As Elliot Sperling has documented more concrete evidence of the source of Mongol interest in Tibetan Buddhism can be found in the direction and the character the ensuing Mongol expedition to Tibetan territory took, launched from the former Tsongkhet capital. In 1240, one year after Chinggis's grandson, Kodan Khan, set up his camp in Tongut lands, he sent an expeditionary force led by the surrendered Tongut Dorda into Tibetan specific, <coughs> excuse me, into Tibet, specifically to monasteries active in the former Tongut court. Dorda penetrated into central Tibet, north of Lhasa as far as Penyul, center of the Barum Kag Kagyu cloister. And the last two Tongut imperial preceptors were Barumpa and had established very close ties with the Tongut court. While the Mongols did sack a number of Tibetan monasteries, they spared the Kagyupa, the main source of preceptors to the Tongut court, and which were among the wealthiest in their path, suggesting that the Mongols were eager to take over this relationship with these former Tong, uh, Tongut court chaplains. Kutan Khan also sought out the Karmapas, whose students served as the imperial preceptors at the Tongut court, and Kutan was in turn described in Tibetan sources as the reincarnation of the last Tongut emperor, establishing a previous relationship between Kodun and the second Karmapa, Karmapakshi. Thus, the Mongol Khans were linked to the Tongut imperial line through the recently institutionalized Tibetan succession mechanism of reincarnation, sidestepping issues of clan and bloodlines and positioning the Mongols as the, as the legitimate spiritual successors to the sacral kingship of the Shisha empire. It is interesting in this context to briefly return to Dunhuang for a moment and consider Mogao Cave 465, which has seen multiple attributions. Sadly, when I was at Dunhuang in 1998, Cave 465 was off limits. So I have yet to see this in person, though not without trying. Therefore, I feel hesitant to comment on it. The devil, they say, is in the details. And it is not among the caves that have been made available digitally by the Dunhuang Academy at yidunhuang.com. Previously, K465 had been commonly accepted as a UN period cave, but more recent scholarship from a variety of angles, including iconographic program and stylistic comparisons, suggest that it may be a Tangut, that it may be Tangut. And this is a charge that has been led by Xie Jisheng. As several scholars, such as Ron Lee and Carmen Meinart have more, <clears throat> and others have more recently pointed out, K465 had a Kagyu iconographic program with an emphasis on Chakrasamvara. Here we see, for instance, Samvara and Mahamaya, both forms of Chakrasamvara flanking Vajravarahi, Chakrasamvara's consort. Both Chakrasamvara and Vajravarahi practices were popular among the Tanguts. Recently published technical analysis of the pigments also suggests that the paintings date to somewhere between the late 12th to 13th century, which could mean either Tongret or Mongol patronage. Within this context then, it is interesting to consider that not only did the Tongrets engage heavily with the Kagyu in the late 12th and early 13th centuries, but early engagement with the Mongols was similarly Kagyu focused. Kutan Khan sought out the Karma Kagyu and Munka Khan whose seat of power was likewise former Tongut territory, had previous relationship with the Drigon Kagyu. And this is before Kublai's rise to power and the founding of the Yuan. The Mongols established the largest contiguous empire in world history. From the Korean Peninsula to the gates of Vienna, the Mongols conquered most of Asia in the 13th century, thereby bringing Tibetan visual culture to the Chinese heartland. While Kublai established a government on a Chinese system, they relied heavily on peoples from other areas of his empire, such as the Uyghurs, Tonguts, and Tibetans. 
While the Mon Mongol Empire was known for a policy of religious tolerance among the peoples they conquered and for a generous patronage across a broad spectrum of religions, Kublai Khan singled out Tibetan Buddhism among the faiths competing for court attention. Tibetan Buddhism prevailed in many parts of the Mongol Empire, including the early Mongol Ilkhans in Persia and its founder, Hulugu. So this is not just among the Mongols who ruled China. So why Tibetan Buddhism? Evidence suggests that Mongol interest in Tibetan Buddhism lay in both a model of sacral universal rulership that allowed them to unite an, eth <clears throat> an empire across ethnic and clan divides, as well as the corresponding esoteric means to physical power that could be harnessed to serve the Mongol Imperium. In other words, their interest in Tibetan Buddhism was actually quite practical. One could even say utilitarian. In 1260, Kublai declared himself Great Khan, leading to civil war and fragmentation of the Mongol Empire, Kublai maintaining control of Asia. His Tibetan preceptor, Pagpa, initiated Kublai into Tibetan Buddhist rites, and in turn, Kublai, as his part of his offerings, granted Pagpa suzerainty of the 13 hierarchies of Tibet in the name of the Mongol Empire, which you see here on the left. Later, in 1270, when Kublai Khan declared the founding of his Yuan dynasty, he made Pagpa imperial preceptor the highest religious authority in the land. As, as part of his investiture, he had the crystal seal of the Tongut emperor recreated for Pagpa, likely in emulation of Tongut court ritual. This gave symbolic weight to the Mongols as con conscient, <clears throat> excuse me, as conscious inheritors of the Tonguts and a priest patron relationship with the Tibetans, a relationship whereby the religious leader consecrates the emperor or Khan as a sacral ruler providing legitimacy and lending other spiritual support, which in this context could include advice, extending the life of the ruler, either medicinally or through ritual, suppressing epidemics, controlling the weather, and sometimes even magical warfare. And the patron in return provides material support, protection, and helps spread the, <clears throat> the religion with the expanse of their empire. Memorial halls for Pagpa were sponsored by the court throughout the empire, which could have included his image, it has recently been suggested by David Jackson that some of these key political moments, as understood by later Tibetans, right, and this is a very important caveat, were depicted in these two portraits of Pagpa, right, Kublai's initiation on the left and Pagpa being made imperial preceptor on the right. Pagpa also developed a new script based on Tibetan, commonly called Pagpa script, or more officially, Mongolian square script to phonetically render all of the disparate language of Kublai's empire, which was employed on official documents and insignia such as passports like the one you see here. Significantly, Kublai Khan also had Pakba tutor his heir apparent, Jingam. Until the fall of the dynasty, it became UN practice to appoint Tibetans as imperial preceptors. This relationship between the Mongol emperor Kublai and his Tibetan chaplain Pakba, often characterized as a priest patron relationship became a model that would be invoked by subsequent imperial courts and Tibetans for centuries to come. The wrathful figure of Mahakala in particular, made for Kublai Khan's final assault on the remains of the Chinese Song, Southern Song, became a potent symbol of both Kublai's rule and the Yuan imperial lineage. Mahakala was credited with intervening in several key battles and temples dedicated to Mahakala were built throughout the empire. In the most famous example, in 1275, Kublai asked his Tibetan imperial preceptor Pagpa for the protector deity Mahakala to intervene against the Southern Song, which his greatest general could not conquer. An image of Mahakala was made facing south, right, facing the Song, and the rites were performed. Mahakala was cited going house to house on the battlefield, sending Chinese troops fleeing. When the Chinese petitioned their Taoist god of war, Jun Wu, to deliver them from the Mongol onslaught, the god left a note on his altar saying that he had to yield to the great black god leading the Mongol army, right? Mahakala means great black one. And within a short time, the Chinese surrendered. Interestingly, this account of the fall of Southern Song through the intervention of Mahakala is recorded in Chinese sources. And in the biography, the Chinese biography of the, Chinese, of the Tibetan ritual specialist involved, it ends with, this is proof of how he aided the state. 
Such stories are also corroborated in Tibetan sources, which record that when the captured former emperor of the Song and his courtiers were brought north and showed the temple, they were astonished to see the image of Mahakala as they had seen him among Mongol troops. That very Tibetan Buddhist sculpture became one of the objects emblematic of Mongolian kingship. This association was so strong that even four centuries later, when the Manchus, lacking the proper bloodlines, traced their own spiritual ancestry to Kublai Khan as the rightful inheritors of his Yuan legacy, installed the same statue of Mahakala in their own imperial shrine in 1635. A special appreciation and dispensation for craftsmen under the Mongol rule, first established by Chinggis Khan, continued under Kublai, and the arts flourished under Mongolian patronage. Chinese luxury mediums newly employed for the creation of Tibetan Buddhist images during the Yuan included dry lacquer, which you see on the left, and porcelain, which you see on the right. Chinese sources tend to broadly describe this new imperial idiom as fan xiang, which might be rendered as Indic images, seeming to conflate the Indian, Nepalese, Tibetan, and Tongut modes that informed it. Lushly produced Tibetan Buddhist icons in the very same silk technique popular in the Tongut court became a, singer, <clears throat> a signature of Mongol imperial court production, such as this monumental silk tapestry or kusa now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection. Its large scale is consistent with records of UN imperial commissions, which were always nine and a half by eight feet. And while this is the only surviving complete example, this particular commission to my knowledge is not recorded. Technical aspects of the weaving are closer to Tongut production than Song works, leading some scholars like Xiao Yan to suggest that the weavers were either Tonguts or Uyghurs. Two Mongolian Khans at the lower left and their spouses at lower right are all named by Tibetan cartouches, King Tuk Tamur on the left and his older brother here named Prince Koshila with their respective spouses, Lady, <coughs> Lady Buddha Shiri and Lady Babusha. The political intrigues around these four Mongol imperial figures is fascinating and helps us date this object as Tuk Tamur came to power as the result of a coup d'etat in 1328. His older brother Koshila only reigned briefly from February 27th to August 30th, 1329, when he was assassinated by Tuktamur's entourage out of fear of his military strength and a resulting Chagatai Khanate influence on the Yuan dynasty. Tuktamur was then re-enthroned but died of disease three years later. The titles differentiated in the Tibetan cartouches would suggest that King Tuktamur was already named Khan in September 1328 but Prince Koshila was not yet enthroned in February 1329, placing the design, if not creation, in late 1328 or early 1329. There has been quite a bit of speculation uh, about this image. While we have thus far focused on the struggle between these two brothers, and actually their wives as well, to pinpoint the dating of the title seen on this object, to think about why it was commissioned and why this group uh, is of figures are depicted together, it is perhaps more profitable to focus on what unites them. It might not surprise anyone to learn that my working hypothesis is that this is related to po political power and control. As I already mentioned, these brothers came to power as the result of a coup d'etat in 1328, engineered by the Chipchak officer El Timur and backed by the American minister Bayan to restore the exiled sons of Emperor Haishan, that is, this is uh, Kuluk Khan, to the throne when Emperor Yisun Tamur died in Shangdu in 1328, right? And this is because uh, Haishan's brother promised uh, Haish that Haishan's son would be named the crown prince, but this didn't happen. This resulted in a two-month civil war which split the military, the great non chinggisid families, as well as the imperial family right down the middle. This coup started in September 8th in, da in Dadu and ended with the surrender of Yisun Timur's partisans in Shangdu in November 23rd. So the dates work quite nicely with the titles given in the uh, silk tapestry just discussed. And if true, would narrow the range of its commission to about October 16th to around November 15th, 1328. Now it could also have been uh, made to commemorate their joint victory and in recognition of the deity's role 
much as temples to Mahakala were, were built throughout the land following the victory over Southern Song, which would push the date to somewhere between mid-December to late February, uh, 1329. And why was this mandala chosen? Within the Tibetan ritual context, Vajrabhairava was one of the main early war magic deities. As Brian Cuevas explains, the Vajrabhairava tantras are replete with measures for coercing, immobilizing, causing dissension, eradicating and driving away, bewildering, inflicting illness and annihilating. For example, in the late 9th and early 10th century, right, shortly after the collapse of the Tibetan Empire, Nup Sangye Yeshe, here on the left, who Cuevas describes as Tibet's first Buddhist political sorcerer, employed the fierce rites of Vajrabhairava to, to subjugate his rivals. In the early 11th century, the Tibetan translator Ralo Tsawa, here on the right, was especially famous for ending many of the adversaries uh, through magical rituals of the fierce divinities Vajrabhairava and Yamantaka. And raw, <coughs> and raw transmissions were very prominent in the Sakya lineages. And remember, this is the school that provided the preceptors to the Mongol court. One Sakya scholar, Gyatun Gunga uh, Tsundru, who flourished about 1300, right? This is right about the time we're talking about, first spread the raw transmissions as far north as the Tangut lands. This silk tapestry has been identified by Tsangwang Gindan Dempa as depicting a mandala of the 49 Vajrabhairava deities according to the imperial preceptor Pagpa's sadhana of the 49 Vajrabhairavas written in 1275. Regardless of the system, Cuevas explains, everything surrounding the practice of Vajrabhairava relates to power, whether offensive or defensive, especially for eliminating obstacles. This is the true purpose of this specific cycle of tantras. And fierce rites of Vajrabhairava continue to be used to secure political power by rulers and their state apparatus, from the fifth Dalai Lama and the Ganden Pojang government in central Tibet to the Chenlong emperor in Beijing. So I see this as an image of power much like Kublai Khan's uh, Mahakala sculpture. Now, as I said, this is still only a working theory and there's still a lot of legwork to be done to try to document this in Tibetan and Chinese sources. So I'm interested to hear our audience's thoughts on this alternate reading of this very famous object. So let the whole poking begin. After the Mongols conquered the Tanguts and absorbed them in 1227, Tanguts continued to be employed under the Mongols. The Tanguts' versatility being adept at Tibetan and Chinese linguistic, doctrinal, as well as artistic traditions was no doubt valued by the Mongols in both forging and implementing the political and doctrinal policies of their own, em <clears throat> of their own empire, which followed numerous Tanguts precedents. So in the interest of time, I will just touch on a few examples as they are, as they are quite well known and often discussed. The most prominent example is the notorious minister Yang, who was made head of the Bureau of Religious Affairs of Southeast China in 1277. In his sponsorship, one sees a focus on subduing the land of the newly conquered territories by building stupas, and this is one classic use of the stupa, as well as reestablishing former Buddhist temples and monasteries. His activities in Hangzhou on the east coast of China included commissioning numerous stone sculptural niches carved directly into the local landscape at Fei Lai Feng. The statues included uh, deities popular in the Tangut court, such as Usnisha Vijaya, which you see here. Other evidence of the continuation of Tangut practice was the enormous undertaking of the printing of the Tangut edition of the Buddhist canon in about 1301 in Hangzhou, one of China's largest and most important printing centers. These frontispieces were also repurposed for other printing projects, such as the massive Qisha Canon in about 1302, also overseen by a Tangut. And here's an example from the New York Public Library. These incorporated numerous translations of Tibetan texts, such as Pagpa's advice to Kublai Sun, the crown prince. However, many of the Tibetan texts added into the Chinese Buddhist Canon during the Yuan were actually translated, translations uh, made under the Tanguts. And I believe Susan Huang is actually uh, working on a book on this material. All right, and she's our speaker next. So I encourage everyone to uh, listen in. 
Tongut script was also employed on politically significant geo-religious monuments, such as the Zhuyongguan Stupa Gate to the north of Beijing, even as late as 1345, over a century after the fall of Xixia. A number of various inscriptions in Tibetan, Mongolian, written in Pagpa script, which you see here, Uyghur, Tangut, and Chinese, lining the walls of the gate, declare Kublai Khan as an emanation of the Bodhisattva of wisdom, Manjushri, establishing the sacral nature of his rulership and his empire. This point will become especially significant when the Manchus conquer China and declare themselves Kublai Khan's spiritual and political inheritors as emanations of the same deity. While there has been some debate about if Kublai was considered Manjushri in his own lifetime, Evidence of contemporary Tibetans questioning the validity of this assertion suggests that it was at least promoted. So now we're moving uh, beyond uh, the period where Dunhuang was active, but even after the collapse of the Mongol Yuan and the Chinese reclaimed their land, establishing the native Ming dynasty, the Chinese court continued to follow Mongol precedents for an imperial Buddhist vocabulary symbolic of divine rule. By this time, Kublai Khan's model of rulership was recognized across Asia, and thus the early Ming rulers were speaking in the accepted language of power in declaring their authority. Ming rulers, such as the Yongle Emperor, invoked the relationship between Pagpa and Kublai in establishing his own relationship with Tibetan hierarchs. Yongle was the first Ming emperor to establish significant ties with the Tibetan patriarchs. Now he had seized the throne Thus a cloud hung over his legitimacy. So as part of his strategy to bolster his right to rule, Yongle invited high lamas, such as the Karmapa, who you see here on the left, to come to court. Indeed, after their visits, Yongle styled himself a universal Chakravarchin ruler. And here you can see in this relationship codified, I pulled out this detail, where the Yongle is receiving consecration as a sacral ruler, where his face is reflected in uh, the mirror here and is anointed as part of these rites, just like the consecration of an image. So continuing to trace these imperial practices first established on the Silk Road, I wanna give just one quick example. This remarkably intricate 15th century silk embroidery of the meditational deity Havaja served as both a diplomatic gift and documentation of imperial legitimacy. According to an extensive Tibetan dedicatory inscription on the back, it was gifted to the Tibetan Lama Shaki Yeshe in recognition of his visit to the emperor. The choice of subject matter for this gift is quite telling. As Hivajra was an essential initiation given to the Mongol emperors as part of their sacral investiture. Yongle followed these Yuan precedents in his own initiation as a sacral ruler, receiving the, Hivana, <coughs> the Hivajra initiation from each of the three main Tibetan hierarchs who visited court. He thus received both blessings and also a kind of consensus about his legitimacy from the three major leaders of the time. The, th the theme of this gift is therefore as much about authenticating Yongle's initiation into this tradition and his legitimacy as a sacral ruler as it is about the Tibetan Lama who received it. However, Tibetan Buddhism was not consistently supported during the Ming when the Tibet crazed Zhengde Emperor, right, who even as styled himself an incarnate Lama, died without an heir in 1521, and the ascension of a different branch of the imperial family marked an important shift in imperial identity, a break in imperial patronage with Tibetans, and a shift away from Kublai's model of rule. However, this waning imperial interest was quickly replaced by a second massive conversion of the Mongols in the late 16th and 17th centuries. The Manchus, like the Mongols, were a people from the north of the Great Wall who conquered China and assumed Tibetan Buddhism as a means of political legitimacy and ruling a vast multi-ethnic empire. During their Qing dynasty, Tibetan Buddhism was once again an official religion of the empire. Under the Manchus, the visual language of Buddhist imperial rule was further refined and the concepts of sacral legitimacy given a finer point with a special focus on the cult of Manjushri. Now the Qing-Tibet connection is really quite well known so I'll just be brief to allow time for uh, discussion. 
The Manchu emperors, lacking the proper bloodlines to the Mongol ruling house, trace their own spiritual ancestry to Kublai Khan through Tibetan succession mechanism of reincarnation. By promoting themselves as emanations of the Bodhisattva of wisdom Manjushri, they declared themselves Kublai Khan reborn and the rightful inheritors of his Yuan legacy. This Manchu inheritance of Kublai's realm was propagated through the production of religious art. This was but one of several mutually reinforcing strategies aimed at various subjects and neighboring peoples, especially the Mongols in establishing and solidifying the Manchu's multi-ethnic empire in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Manchu rulers adopted certain personas to turn themselves into representatives of those respective cultures, whether Chinese or Mongol, Confucian or Buddhist, legitimizing their position and appropriating those cultural traditions by denying their image as outsiders who gained possession of them through force. So cultural appropriation isn't just a 21st century phenomenon. It was the Qianlong Emperor, who you see here, more than any other Manchu ruler who realized the potential of patronizing Tibetan Buddhism, as is evidenced by the incredible volume of Tibetan Buddhist images produced by the imperial workshops. Some of the most politically pointed images included many paintings depicting the Qianlong Emperor as an em emanation of Manjushri and by extension Kublai Khan. And you can see this inscription here uh, really is not subtle. Uh, this inscription running at the bottom. The sagacious Manjushri, the great being who manifests as Lord of men, King of the Buddhist law, maybe he steadfast on the Vajra throne. This production of religious art to underscore Manchu inheritance of Kublai's realm included the use of silk tapestry and dry lacquer to create Tibetan Buddhist images, which can be traced to Yuan imperial workshops. By using such material and techniques, the Qing also connected themselves to the Mongol imperial legacy. And as we can remember, this tradition of silk actually started on of, uh, Tibetan icons on the Silk Road, uh, was started on the Silk Road. Now, I have painted more than a millennium with too broad a brush, but the purpose here is to trace these patterns over a broad spectrum of faith, <clears throat> sorry, a broad spectrum to give the big picture. The objective of my talk today is to reground Tibetan Buddhist art in this historical context and highlight a dynamic aspect of this tradition related to power. One, may that, <clears throat> one that may run counter to popular perceptions, yet is critical in understanding its importance on the world stage. And I hope you have also gotten the sense that the Silk Road have very prominent role to play in its development and spread. I look forward to your questions and feedback on how I can further develop this material and find closer tie-ins to Dunhuang and the Silk Road. Thank you. Our first question tonight is, where is the silk tapestry of Lama Zhang now? Oh, that's in the Tibet Museum in Lhasa. Okay, so you have to travel to Lhasa if you want to see it. it every time I've been to the museum in Lhasa though, it's been on display. So I don't think they changed their uh, exhibit, even though silk of course is incredibly uh, vulnerable to silk. So I'm not saying you'll definitely see it, but is yeah. of a high probability. There's maybe. a good chance. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So from Anne, thank you, Carl, for the presentation. I noticed that the painting Kublai Khan naming Pagpa Imperial Preceptor is dated to the late 15th and 16th century, which mm -hmm. is a bit later than Kublai Khan's time. Was mm -hmm. this image a copy of an earlier work? And why was Kublai Khan's image painted in a later period? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Um, so David Jackson attributes uh, these the original um, composition of these two portrait paintings uh, to a, a 15th century, a very famous 15th century uh, Tibetan painter. Um, and uh, so if you follow that logic, then both of them are later copies of the 15th century composition. Um, but uh, the accuracy of the depiction of the Khan, especially of the one of uh, him being uh, uh, anointed imperial preceptor, uh, is just so accurate. Um, I don't, we can go back actually. I um, hope I don't give anyone car sickness. Um, Nobody's complained of it yet. So. Here we go. Um, 
Oh, actually, I have a close up. There we go. Um, the accuracy here, right, uh, of uh, Kublai Khan, but even Chabi, uh, I don't know if you can notice, you notice, but you see this very distinctive uh, headdress. There's uh, a little uh, peacock feather sticking out of the top, right? So clearly, whoever did these original compositions um, uh, had access to earlier models. And I believe um, that I also got some uh, uh, feedback that some of the architecture also seems to be quite uh, accurate as well. So my guess is that uh, um, whoever painted these paintings, and actually the other painting here, the one of Pakba initiated Kublai Khan is even later uh, copy. Um, these, so these are uh, later copies of, of earlier works. And it's um, very common to copy these uh, lineage master portraits. Uh, so you know, when you start a new series of lineage portraits, you would uh, quite commonly copy uh, a previous one. Um, and the reason that Kublai Khan is depicted so prominently is that Kublai Khan and the Mongol Empire was incredibly important to the Tibetans, right? So it's not just that the Tibetans are providing something for the Mongols. The Mongols are also the greatest uh, patrons uh, that they've ever seen. They completely, you know, so they put Sakya basically in political power, uh, not without Mongol troops, by the way. Uh, Tibet was definitely garrisoned with Mongol troops. Um, uh, right, so when, uh, like when Drigong uh, Kagyu rise up against them, uh, you know, the Mongols go in to uh, take care of that situation. Uh, so, so the Kublai Khan is, is, is not as very important to, to the, um, to the Sakya, especially uh, in this time period. So, uh, you know, just the way also you see the fifth Karmapa, I hope you see a, a parallel here, just the way the fifth Karmapa here uh, is depicted together with the, the imperial patron, the Yongle emperor, right? So you can see there's a kind of a relationship here. Now, these paintings are not done by court painters. There's no way they're gonna paint the emperor little and uh, um, the, the Tibetan uh, master large, but you know this is from a Tibetan perspective, of course. Um, not quite. If, uh, let me know if I haven't answered that question enough. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl. We have another question. Um, thank you for a wonderful and enlightening talk. I've often imagined the influence of Tibetan Buddhism limited to Central and East Asia, but you briefly mentioned Tibetan Buddhism was present in the Il Khanate, in influencing Hulegu Khan in particular. Where would one find evidence of this? Uh, well, the short and easy answer uh, is that Elliot Sperling wrote a very nice article on this. Uh, I think called Hulugu in Tibet. Um, so uh, for secondary sources, uh, you can look at that. But I mean, it's very interesting because uh, the Ilkhanite uh, is one of, you know, so when the Mongol empire fragmented, uh, the Ilkhanite is, is one of the few of the uh, Khanites that actually recognize Kublai's authority. And, um, you know, even though they had uh, their own, um, their uh, own Khan and whatnot, mm -hmm. they still uh, recognized Kublai's authority as Kagan, as the great Khan. So there's a closer relationship there. Uh, anyway, uh, it's actually Hulugu and the Western Mongols um, uh, who actually helped back, uh, I think the Drigong, <laughs> the Drigong rebellion against the Sakya. So they're actually you know, involved in Tibetan politics as well. Uh, so uh, I think it's five generations of, of Ilkhanate Khans are followers of Tibetan Buddhism before the conversion to Islam, right? Uh, so um, it's a, it's a um, how shall I say? It's not just a flash in the pan. And this is one of the reasons that I don't just say Yuan. I don't just call everything Yuan because this is a larger phenomenon. And in fact, when the Mongols, uh, uh, first, uh, you know, basically take over Tibet. They divide, um, they divide up Tibet by uh, the different uh, religious schools and monasteries and become right. their patrons, right? So as I mentioned, right, um, 
you know, these different cons are, are, uh, are involved in these different uh, uh, traditions. And, um, you know, that, that's not limited just to Kublai Khan or even his uh, branch of the imperial family. All right, thank but you. See you see it in Tibetan sources too as well, but I would go to Elliot's uh, article to, to find the specific citations. Okay. We had a question. Um, is it totally naive to think of the Tibetan Buddhist advisors as coming from some geographically significant place, sort of like Mecca as a sacred place granting authority? That's an interesting question. Um, I think there is some of that, uh, right? I mean, basically you have the decline, I mentioned in the very beginning, right? With the, the uh, collapse of classical India in the sixth century, uh, there is a series of invasions and Buddhism is really struggling for survival. There's big monastic institutions. And so uh, after um, Buddhism, uh, India no longer becomes a viable pilgrimage source, uh, you know, for, in, for Buddhist teachings, then Tibet becomes kind of the surrogate holy land. Um, and so you'll actually see uh, in, for instance, in early Ming paintings from the 15th century, you'll see depictions of uh, uh, masters, right? Arhats in, uh, who were supposed to be, you know, uh, the original disciples of the Buddha, presumably Indian, and they're writing in Tibetan. Oh. Right. So there's this kind of a conflation. And in fact, in Chinese sources too, you'll find uh, references where they'll just sort of say, uh, a monk from the West. And sometimes that's uh, Indian, sometimes it's uh, Nepalese, but very often it's Tibetan, right. could be Tangut. But, um, you know, once you do a little digging, like at Wutai Shan, right, mm -hmm. the Tibetans are all over Wutai Shan as well, as are uh, many other groups. And so uh, if you read the gazetteers, they sometimes uh, will just say from the West, but when you do a little digging, you find that they're, they're Tibetan. Uh, and actually sometimes the characters for Fan, uh, uh, Sanskrit or Indian and Fan for Tibetan are con confused uh, and conflated. Oh. So I think there is this kind of uh, surrogacy that's going on and conflation. Yeah, it's a great question. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, we have a question. Were there many mandala tapestries made during the Qing dynasty compared to the period of the 12th to the early 15th centuries? Well, I will say that the Qing court really cranked out everything, especially under Qianlong. I mean, in the, the, the only ruler actually who even comes close to production of Tibetan Buddhist images in the imperial court is actually the Yongle emperor who we're looking at right now. Um, right. And quite a lot in silk. Mandalas, I have not looked into mandalas specifically, but you know, can I just let me, in some of these images here, right? I mean, here we see the true image of Mandrushri, uh, which ties directly into uh, Chenlong as Mandrushri and Wu Tai Shan. Um, and, uh, you know, the one in the center here is done in the same Kusa. Um, a technique where, you know, this is uh, Tibetan icons done in this silk technique is actually innovation on the Silk Road uh, becomes, you know, part and parcel of this uh, imperial visual vocabulary uh, uh, of the imperial courts all the way up into the early 20th century. Right. Mandala specifically, I mean, it really wouldn't surprise me, but it's not something I've, I've looked into specifically. Maybe there's a a Qing specialist uh, lurking in the wings who can chime in here. If there are any Qing specialists specifically in Buddhist production at Qianlong, Qianlong's court, please let us know. Oh, but, but one thing I will say mandala wise in the Qing court is actually that the, uh, that Beijing was considered a Vajrabhairava mandala, mm -hmm. right? And Vajrabhairava and Vajrabhairava was uh, um, uh, enshrined in the big white stupa, right, in, in Beijing. And exactly. this all ties right back into Chen, uh, to Kublai Khan as Manjushri, Chenlong as Manjushri, therefore, right, they are emanations of the same deity. And uh, so this, this notion of kingdom as mandala is very much alive and well. And in fact, you know, on, in, on the war magic front, uh, uh, 
Chenlong had a chapel to Vajrabhairava uh, mm -hmm. in the imperial court uh, in the imperial city, and that's where he kept his armor. So oh. I think you can see a continuation uh, of that. But sorry, I, I can't speak off the top of my head about uh, silk images of, of mandalas, but I mean, uh, a great place actually to look would be, there have been a series of publications by Luo and Hua and a number of other uh, specialists on Tibetan Buddhism at court published by the Palace Museum in Beijing. Uh, so that would be my first place to look if I wanted to uh, explore that further. Thank you, Carl. We have, um, wow, kind of a, a forecasting question. Um, Carl, how do you, what do you think about the development of Tibetan Buddhism in China in the future? Ooh, that's a tricky <laughs> one. That's a very tricky one. It is. Uh, well, I will say Tibetan Buddhism is inc incredibly popular in China, mm -hmm. both mainland China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Uh, I apprenticed with a Tibetan painter uh, in uh, Nepal for about a year and a half. And he had a lot of uh, Cantonese uh, patrons sort of at the high level. Um, and so, uh, you know, I saw that on a, on a regular basis. Um, and actually, I think one of the reasons that uh, Tibetan Buddhism is being clamped down on now by the government is because of its popularity with Chinese followers, right? Yeah. So like Larungar, which is really, if you follow anything about Tibetan Buddhism in China, has really come under the screws and, you know, this massive areas are being torn down and, and it's being uh, limited, I think has as much to do about the popularity of these lamas uh, with Chinese practitioners, right? Because okay. uh, they really want, a kind of state control of religion. I mean, you don't just see that with Buddhism, you see it with Christianity and other traditions, but I think they're especially concerned uh, with Tibetan Buddhism's uh, popularity with, with the Chinese uh, followers. So I think it's very strong, right? And I think that um, right now there's a, you know, you see with what's going on. I mean, the really the funny thing though, is that their Chinese followers, all the Chinese followers that I've met, and I've met plenty of them on my field work. The interesting is, thing is that they don't, conf they don't see any connection between the fate of Tibetans and Tibetan institutions and their, and their interest in Tibetan Buddhism. Wow. Uh, so, so that's a tricky bit there. Um, there's kind of this disconnect. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of wonder when we move past this, uh, well, I hope we move past this uh, intense uh, emphasis on a, a national, uh, a unified national um, narrative, right? I mean, in the 90s, uh, in, when I started uh, graduate school, uh, well, in the 80s and 90s, um, there was a, a real celebration of uh, ethnic diversity in China, right? And that's when uh, Tibetan monasteries will be allowed to rebuild, but also uh, scholarship on Tibetan Buddhism and art history and everything really kind of flowered. Um, yeah. But now uh, things are, awesome. are, are quite different. But, you know, I, my sense is that Tibetan Buddhism is, is so popular with, Chine with uh, Chinese followers who are really looking for something beyond uh, you know, uh, the Yinghang as temple, right? The, the worship of, of money. And they're really looking for something to, to uh, you know, to enrich their lives. And I think that if, if things are relaxed, then uh, I think that it could really become um, a major source of support for some of these uh, institutions. But, you know, dare I tread any farther, um, you know, uh, I, I think hopefully that, that answers the, the question. I think that's very well stated, Carl. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the Qianlong Emperor. Um, how much contact was there between Qianlong himself, the Qing um, Empire under him, and the West? And the West? Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Uh, 
Actually, there's a lot, right? I mean, you've got uh, Jesuit missionaries working at court. So for instance, um, whoops, hee hee, that's related to the previous question. Um, so this portrait, uh, right, is actually a collaboration between probably a Mongolian Tibetan Buddhist monks at court and the Jesuit uh, um, court paint, uh, painter, uh, mm -hmm. Giuseppe Castiglione, right, who did this very, you see the face here, this kind of photorealistic face. Um, and so here actually you see in this one icon, the result of this extremely, um, how do you say, cosmopolitan inter international culture at the Chenlong court. And he's interested yeah. in technology, right, clocks and, um, in fact, one of his favorite gifts to llamas were uh, clocks made by, uh, you know, first Western clock makers. And then he had his, I think he had his uh, mm -hmm. um, court artisans uh, uh, make them. And then, you know, this was a favorite gift to the Pancha Lama or something. Uh, and so, so you see quite a lot of that. Um, and Jesuit canons, right? I mean, the, the, uh, so the, the, the Qing under Qianlong get involved in this uh, kind of local dispute in uh, Gyalrong, right? In Chinese, it's uh, Jinchuan, right? The Jinchuan Wars. And in fact, some people have suggested, Elliot Sperling, Sperling my, my full of disclosure, my uh, advisor, uh, has suggested that, um, you know, that the, the expense of drag, dragging these Jesuit cannons up and down mountain sides, trying to blast the Bonpo out of their mountain fortresses really drained the coffers of the Qing and helped uh, uh, escalate their decline. So, yeah. so you see aspects of contact with the West uh, in Qianlong's court in all, I would say all aspects. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a very interesting uh, bunch, the Manchu emperors. Very much so. Well, Carl, I want to say thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of our question period. Oh, okay. Um, so as we conclude, first and foremost, I want to thank Carl for his excellent presentation. Carl, thank you so much for adding to our knowledge of Tibetan Buddhism and the ways in which it was used to establish and reinforce political hegemony in East and Central Asia. Uh, it was fascinating to see how you trace this role through to the modern era, particularly the Qing dynasty and into the 20th century. So thank you again. So um, I spoke at the beginning of the evening about our upcoming virtual holiday concert featuring the music of the Silk Roads performed by the talented Eurasia, Eurasia Consort Chamber Music Group. Uh, this is a bi-coastal ensemble. They have members in both New York City and in Seattle. Our concert will feature selections of Tang Dynasty music solo pieces from the 1600s played on the Turkish oud, and music by the contemporary composer Bunching Lam. Uh, so again, this concert will be held one week from today on Thursday, December 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the concert will be viewable on our webpage, dunhongfoundation.us, under the news tab in the upper right-hand corner of the, uh, of the page. Further details will be forthcoming in an e-update, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're sincerely grateful for your continued support. Uh, I wish you all a good evening and a very happy beginning to the holiday season. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carl, and good night. <laughs>